Welcome back, everybody. It's time for another Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast where you get your audio, please do so. Just look for Silver and Black Today. Do us a favor. Make sure you turn on that auto download. Also, to our YouTube viewers, hello, and thank you for being with us once again. Always a lively chat on YouTube. I'm Scott Cobranson, your host, along with my partner, my co-host, and that is Mr. Mo Moten from Bleacher Report. He's a senior NFL writer there. Also, Raiders columnist up on sportsnot.com. Make sure you follow him on x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. On that same platform, you can find me at LV Gully. The show is SNB Today. Mo, uh, here we go, man. We're, we're in the single digits. Eight days until, actually seven days from today will be the draft. And uh, it's finally over. We can put aside all the mock drafts. We can put aside all the ifs, what's but all this stuff and the rubber will meet the road. And I know people are excited, but I know I am because then we got to get into how did they do in the draft, right? So we switch from what might they do to what did they do? I'm just glad we'll have some definitive answers on what the Raiders are going to do, especially with that 13 pick at number one. But we all know what's going to happen, Scott, right? The picks <laughs> are going to be made. Half the people are going to hate it. Half the people are going to love the picks. And eventually, we're all going to come together and going to say, you know what? These guys are Raiders. We'll support the Raiders until they're not Raiders anymore. I think that's what Murph likes to say. And that's how it's going to roll. But in the meantime, it's, it's just fun to banter and have these opinions. It is. And uh, we obviously had a great show on Tuesday with Brian Baldinger, always very popular when he comes on our show to talk Raiders. And it's so funny, too, because I see people... <laughs> who didn't like what he said about Penix, right? I had some other people who said, Shocker. wow, he made, a, he made a good point. Then other Shocker. people were like, oh, well, what is he? Well, well. And then I look back and it's the same people who said, I love Baldy when he was praising Max Crosby. So that's just the nature of the beast. Somebody says something you like, you love them. When they say something you don't like, you don't like them. But honestly, we did get some good feedback. And and even, you know, we had some folks, and Baldy's very interactive, by the way, on X.com. If you don't already follow him, follow him at Baldy NFL. <laughs> He had some of our fans, our listeners, comment back on how terrible a take it was. And Baldy answered him and said, why so? Well, well, you know, and then people come back and hem and haw. And he, well, well, well but, but that's just your opinion. He's like, yeah, it's my opinion, but I, it's informed. And Baldy on his podcast also did his quarterback rankings. And like he told us on our show on Tuesday, he had Penix mm -hmm. number two. So mm -hmm. we don't know, though, Mo. Oh, wow, that was a lot of. Though, Mo. We don't know, though, Mo. Oh, yes. Uh, we don't know where the Raiders have Penix. If the Raiders have Penix at three on their quarterback chart, which I'm kind of kind of assume maybe four, and he's there and he's the top rated quarterback they have and they feel that's the greatest need, then they go there. The prevailing thought, I know amongst most of us, you included, is that they go offensive line there. Fuaga's there, obviously a great pick if he's there. Uh, I'm seeing a lot more people now thinking that Fuaga might go earlier, uh, especially if there's some movement in the draft. But also a lot of folks are starting to corner in on a guy I brought up back at the Combine, and that was Terry on Arnold, who we've talked about on our show. We did a preview of that position here. So, so you look at that and you say, man, there's three directions they could go. It's all going to depend what player's there and who they have highest rated on their board. So I wrote this on Bleacher Report. Uh articles out today actually came out today and the one thing i said in my intro is you have to leave room for surprises mm -hmm. right so you can you can okay this team needs a right tackle this team needs a cornerback they're probably going to go this direction how often do you look at the draft and i've seen in my lifetime over 20 drafts how often do you look at the draft and say, you know what? That that turned out exactly how I thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> in the first 10, even in the first 10, point. last year, I was at Bleach Report doing a show, the draft show. Right off the top, the Houston Texans, they grab Sidney Stroud, then they trade up Will Anderson. People in the control room going nuts. Mm -hmm. I'm on air like, what did they, what happened here? You know, like surprises could happen as early as the top five. So we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to pan out. But like I said, it, it, it's fun to have these opinions when it comes to the Raiders. As you said, Terry and Arnold is a popular target for them. I've been on the offensive line train for a while now. 
Baldy has convinced people that the Raiders maybe should take Penix at 13 <laughs> or trade up for him. So there are so many, there are three different directions we all think the Raiders could go. And I also think there's a wild card direction where possibly they trade down. Mm-hmm. I think there's a possibility we haven't talked about a lot on the show, but I think it's it's something that we should go into a bit that what if the Raiders decide, okay, if goes off the board, we don't, we don't love any of the tackles on the board. We want to go quarterback later in the draft. We're, we're just going to trade down. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I think it's a, it's a real possibility. And I think that's what goes into a draft strategy, right? So these, these guys have been for months modeling what they're going to do. Right. So you could, you could imagine being in the Raiders war room right now before the draft where they're like, okay, here's how, if everything goes perfectly, here's, here's, here's the six guys we want in order, ranked in order. Now, What's plan B, C, D, E, F, G, and H? And they're going on down the line. If he goes first and he goes last and he goes second and he goes third, mm-hmm. what do we do? This is a lot of work. I mean, I think people don't understand, and I'm not sitting here trying to say, hey, you should feel bad for these guys because they get to work in professional football. It's a very, very good thing. But these guys go through a lot of scenario building leading up to the draft because, like you said, Mo, it is a complete wild card. We know, number one, yes, 98% chance Caleb Williams going to the Bears, number one. I have no doubt about that. But past that, man, yes, oh, Washington needs a quarterback. But but you don't know. something. Somebody gives them a godfather offer, and they're like, yeah, we'll move down two spots because we still could get this guy or that guy. So anything can happen. Some drafts, as you said, you've seen 20. I've seen a few more. When you look at that, you never know what a team's going to do. These guys, sometimes there's desperation or they have a plan. Or you know what? They're just hell-bent on getting the guy because they believe if somebody believes Jaden Daniels is the guy who will get them a, a, a Lombardi trophy and they're willing to move up to Washington, if they're number five, if they're Minnesota with those two number one picks and they give them an offer, two number ones, now two number ones in consecutive years and a, and a player or whatever, you don't, you never know. You don't know. And, and you mentioned the number of drafts I've seen. I, I'm a little old. I've almost forgotten my age. I've probably watched maybe 25 to 30. Yeah. <laughs> I've been watching the draft since my preteen years, yes. middle school watching drafts. But it's a, I, I wrote about this too, and I said it's always exciting because, as we're saying right now, you just don't know what's going to happen. And I think for Raider fans, it was kind of a bummer that – not a bummer, but you look at the season and say, well, we go 8-9, we have a 13th pick, we need a quarterback, wish we would – are a little bit higher, <laughs> you know, so we can get a better, we have better access to a quarterback. I think some fans are saying we won meaningless games. And I, I'm never of the thought that a win is meaningless because let's remember that Antonio Pierce needed those wins to kind of solidify his job security, right? If he had went, you know, won or lost twice as many games as he, as he won, he probably wouldn't be the head coach right now. So <laughs> if you are an Antonio Pierce person or supporting him to be the head coach, you cannot say that those wins at the end of the season were meaningless because without them, you probably have who knows who you have as a head coach right now. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And also this is what, this is what, and I understand people's desire and, and it makes from a, a pure logical sense. Yes. Had the Raiders lost more games, they'd be higher in the draft. They'd have a better chance at a better quarterback. The same people, though, will also say, well, don't take Penix at 13 because we don't know. There's a risk there. He, his knees, blah, blah, blah. That's the whole thing, right? You, if you had finished worse, different coach, you pick third, maybe you pick Jaden Daniels, maybe Jaden Daniels doesn't work out. Like, you don't know. It's always easier to look back at things and say, now, at the time, there were people who were telling us, right, Mo, in social media, oh, they should lose these games, lose these games. But like you said, Antonio Pierce, who, who you know, I, I have to say that I, I've been impressed with how he's handled himself in the offseason, what he's done, and kind of the, the projection that he's had with the Raider culture and what he's going to do. Uh, so, so to me, you're right. He's not there if they go, if they win two out of those nine games. If they go two and seven, there's no way he gets the job. No way. Exactly. exactly. No way. So you, you, can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. But we'll see. Right. It, it, really quick, though, Scott, social media kind of blew up with my some, I guess, a few people found my Bo Nix tweet about um, I like Michael Penix. I, I want to make yeah. this clear before we go to break. I'm a Michael Penix guy. I don't have him as high as Baldy does. I don't think he's the second best cornerback in the class. Right. 
but I'm on my, I think I'm higher on Michael Penix than a lot of other people. There's still some people, a lot of people who feel like he's, you know, second, third round pick. Again, I think he's a back end first round pick. I'm not saying that, I, you know, I'm not on the Michael Penix train if the Raiders draft him. Yeah. All I'm saying about Bo Nix is that don't be surprised if Bo Nix is the pick simply because of the offense that Luke Getze runs, the offense mm -hmm. that Bo Nix came out of at Oregon. It's a match. Now, people will say, don't go with the schematic fit over the best player available. But you got to remember, these coaches love to run certain systems. And they're looking for the best fit for their system. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it goes with a lot of a lot of coaches in the NFL. Now, some of them get fired. doesn't work out. But, you know, when you're looking at prospects and looking at the best prospect for your football team, that's a factor into it. Sure. And and you brought that up about uh, about Penix a couple shows ago, even before Baldy. And I, I just texted Baldy to tell him that you think he's wrong. Uh, but no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, I think it's just because you're a little angry because if you were wearing a do rag, you look like Michael Penix Jr. You're a doppelganger. So it used to be Kirk Morrison and our buddy Phil over at the Phil's gave out uh, uh, unfiltered, gave out uh, that that picture of you could pass like you could pass for him. It's like imagine. It really quick, Scott. It's funny. I'm gonna have a bit of a surprise come draft week. Uh -oh. I, I'm gonna have a bit. I'm, I'm not gonna spoil uh -oh. it, but I'm gonna have a bit of a surprise. Uh oh, that so you can't miss his his live draft, his Bleacher Report live during the draft. That's gonna be fun. Uh, but yeah, so so but that's the thing. Like you 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 don't know now. Taking a quarterback in the second round, less risky, so to speak, in that you secured a player in the first round. So if Bo Nix were to fall into that, and and Michael Penix Jr. is gone, and and that's the thing. Why not? You know, yes, you have other needs, but I think you get a quarterback like that that has been successful. Why not? We'll see, though. I mean, again, seven days, and we can put all this to rest with the first round because we'll know exactly what they're going to do because they're going to have to pick. So we'll see how it all breaks down. Now, we got people with lots to say. We got six calls to go through in our Raider Nation mailbag when we come back from the break. So we're going to get to your calls by the way, if you want to call in for next week's show, now we have the draft on Thursday. And so we'll have a Tuesday show and then uh, we'll see about Thursday show because we've had enough draft preview stuff. So we may end up doing a show on Friday if Mo's available, if he can fit it in and we'll get um, we'll, we'll get some reaction to the draft. So we'll see there. But if you want to call in so we can do mailbag, it's 702 900 7869 702 900 7869 for your calls. All right, Mo and I are going to come back right after this message and we're going to get to the Raider Nation mailbag. Don't go anywhere. Raider Nation is never shy. You ask, we answer. It's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. What's on your mind, fam? Drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Now. It's your time to speak up. Yes, it is. Oh, the fans are getting itchy, Mo. Raider Nation's getting itchy. Like they camped out in the middle of a mosquito hive, you know. <laughs> what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We'll see. Right? The anticipation is there. I, I get the logistics of everything because pro days have to happen and all that stuff. But I wish the yeah. NFL would move the draft up at least a week. Yeah. At least a week. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know they, they start workouts. Obviously, that's the one thing we didn't talk about last segment. The Raiders are um, doing the, the the voluntary workouts now out in Henderson. And so we've seen guys roll in. We saw the Gardner Minshew. I should have put a picture up here for the video, folks. But um, <laughs> the picture of, of Gardner Minshew showing up in his little ass boy shirt <laughs> in the Raider font. Oh, that was funny, man. That was good stuff. I thought that it was, was fake when I you saw it. I was like... Yeah, but he's in the building. It's like, no, he actually, they, they, they made that up for him, or he made it up. And uh, it was, that was awesome. You talk about walk, walking in the locker room the first time to meet all the guys that are there. Like, breaks the ice immediately. It's perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's the thing with Minshew. Whether, whether he wins the starting job, maybe the Raiders don't go for quarterback, or they go for a fourth rounder again, and just, you know, whatever. Then, then just having that guy in a locker room, I think that's one of the, one of the things, too, because he fits in so well with, with Antonio Pierce's attitude, right, and what he wants to do. Not because he's flash or he's funny, but because he's he's authentic. And and Gardner Minshew is going to tell it like it is. He's got swagger, man. 
That's the thing about some of the Raiders that they brought in. I I, re- I forgot who said it, but mm-hmm. when Christian Wilkins was signed, and I you know again, I apologize if the person is listening. Person said it, Christian Wilkins was a Raider before the Raiders actually signed him. <laughs> like he was the most Raider player out there that wasn't actually on the roster. And right. you can kind of say the same about Garner Minshew. And it goes back to my point that Antonio Pierce is looking for a certain type of player. Yes. And, you know, one of the things, too, and I, and I want to bring this up because I think there's although people were getting too angry about it, but uh, a valid point, And that is we've been talking about the quarterback situation with the Raiders, Mo. And I always like to bring listener feedback because we do listen, we watch, you know, and, 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 and make sure we address it. And there's like, guys, there's three quarterbacks on the roster. Anthony Brown. You forgot about Anthony Brown. Anthony Brown is on the roster. And by the way, Mo, this is you start piecing stuff together. Anthony Brown played where? Oregon. Right? Luke Getze, you're talking about Bo Nix? Eh. So <laughs> they Stop obviously they the like, pot. They like Anthony Brown uh, as a developmental pot. quarterback. I don't think, I think Anthony Brown, I think you're going to have four quarterbacks in camp. Uh, you're probably going to keep three of those. But you could keep four. I don't know. But Anthony Brown, to me, he's 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 a wild card. He's going to come in there. We'll see what he does. If he goes nuts and 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 it makes the roster, great. If not, if they don't draft a quarterback, he certainly would be the 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 third quarterback, the the emergency quarterback. But if they get a quarterback in the draft, then there's an odd man out, I think, because I don't think you're going to carry four. But um, so yes, we know Anthony Brown's roster. We just didn't factor him in as legitimate contender for the starting position. Based on the assumption, <laughs> the Raiders will draft a quarterback. That's that's what I've been saying. Yes. The reason Anthony Brown is not a highlight of this show is because we don't feel like Anthony Brown is going to start at any point in the upcoming season. Right. And I can confidently say it's probably not going to happen. Not to discount the guy, hmm. but this reminds me of the Chase Garbers people who were coming after me when they said, <laughs> Chase Garbers is going to start a game in yeah. 2023. And I was like, Chase Garbers is not going to play a game. No. And Chase Garbage did not play a game for the Raiders. And again, I'm not putting down Anthony Brown, but if we're being realistic here, they signed Gardner Minshew to a decent bridge gap quarterback deal. And Aiden O'Connell, as many of you have said who listen to the show, finished the season pretty well last year for a rookie right. fourth rounder. Right. Those are those are the, the two front running guys for the job. And of course, if they draft someone in the first or second round, that quarterback is going to have a good chance to challenge. Gardner Minshew or Aiden O'Connell over Anthony Brown. Let's be correct. Real. Correct. And so that that's where when you look at how things are going down, that's that's how we see it going. And again, Anthony Brown, if the Raiders and it's not in, it's not a, a, a crazy scenario. If the Raiders don't draft a quarterback in this draft because of the way things then, fall, right. then Anthony Brown's clearly a number three guy and they might even bring in an undrafted free agent. I think there's four quarterbacks in camp always. Just why not? Uh, yeah. But but Anthony Brown would have the opportunity to earn that emergency quarterback slash practice team guy uh, moving in. So there you go for your Anthony Brown people. I know some of you are going to tell me he's the next C.J. Stroud, and that's cool. <laughs> got to go with your opinion. Hey, everybody's got opinions, and they're worth hearing. So there you go. All right. We're going to get to the calls. By the way, let me, let me um, flash up the number if I can do this. Let's see. Yes, I can. Uh, if you want to come in and call for the next show. You didn't do it for this show. That's okay. You can do it next time. Make sure you call in. Uh, it's not live, though. I have to edit that so it doesn't say live. Call in now and leave your message. <laughs> I'm editing on the fly here as we do this. Uh, but, yes, so you can call 702-900-7869 to be part of the show. As you'll hear the calls we got this week, six of them. Everybody's just raring to go. So there we go. So we will get to that. And uh, But you can call in 702 900 Seven eight six nine is the number to be a part. So here we go. Here's our first call coming in on the Raider Nation hotline. Hey, Scott Amo, this is Mike in California. Just calling to check in. I uh, got some few thoughts on the Raiders, what they should do potentially. Um, I think that honestly, the cost to trade up to whether it's three or or four uh, would be too high. For one of these quarterbacks, although it's a very big need, uh, I believe that we have some other positions that we can bolster. So in the future, 
if we draft a uh, quarterback either next year or even just for this year with, I think, a solid bridge guy quarterback in Gardner Minshew, um, it would just help out the team overall. Uh, honestly, I think what the Raiders should do is um, potentially just get a quarterback in next year's free agency. Uh, there's some big names out there, um, potentially in Jerry Goff, who's pretty solid. There's, of course, the big name in Dak Prescott, which I know he's going to cost a lot of money, but I believe he's a really good quarterback. Um, and also there's another one, which I think is very interesting as well, is uh, Tua. I think, you know, with the connection that Tom Telesco had, uh, we, he really wanted to draft Tua back in 2020 draft, I believe. And um, I don't think Tua would cost that much. I think he's a pretty good quarterback. And if we, let's say, at 13, we draft a right a right tackle like that, that kid from Oregon State, or uh, we draft uh, who I think is number one corner and uh, Terry on Arnold, um, potentially getting a franchise guy. Because, honestly, as a Raiders fan, I'm, I don't remember the last good right tackle we had. <laughs> um, I've still got PTSD from our our Brandon Parker days, all those false starts and, and penalties. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, potentially just not drafting a quarterback or just drafting one later and um, potentially just rocking it uh, once we have this year and going into – 2025 for AC all in on one of the proven uh, franchise quarterbacks. Appreciate you taking my call. Y'all have a great day. All right. There's Mike in California. Mike, thank you for the call. Brings up a good point. And we talked about it a little bit earlier. Maybe the Raiders don't draft a quarterback and wait till next year. My issue with that, and we've been stead- steadily beating the drum that you got to get your quarterback, got to get your quarterback, got to get your quarterback, uh, is two things. One is, to build a winning team, you could go get a free agent quarterback. If you got the rest of the team there and you're just lacking that quarterback, I mean, you look what Atlanta did. They have a pretty good roster. They still have a little ways to go, but they went out and they spent all the money on Kirk Cousins. They feel like, okay, we need him. We'll go get him that way. Uh, is is two is you just you're you're pushing the risk down the road. Number one, you don't know who's going to be available. Yes, the free agent class for 2025. When you look at at quarterbacks. You're looking at Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, Jared Goff, Jimmy Garoppolo, Jordan Love, who's going to mm-hmm. sign in, in Green Bay, Sam Darnold, Trevor Lawrence, who's going to sign in Jacksonville, Trey Lance, back to Jacoby Brissett. He's there every year. He mentioned Tua. Past that, Justin Fields, if, they, if, the, if the Steelers don't um, give him his option, he'd be restricted. So you look at that. Is it better than this year? Yes, is it a guy? Is there a guy there that's going to be available that could be your franchise quarterback for the next five or six years? I don't think so. And we get back to what you and I always beat the drum on, Mo, which is rookie contract for a quarterback, especially a quarterback that performs well, at least by year two, is so big. You can't always do it, but if you can try to do it, you should. Okay, multiple things here, and I'll try not to be too long with it. Because <laughs> the call, my, Mike, great on the call. call? Mike from California, was, yes. Mike from California had a great call. He brought up a lot of things, a lot that I agree with. The right tackle thing, I think, is overlooked. A lot of people talk about Raiders. Mm-hmm. How long has it been since they had, you know, stability at defensive tackle? How long has it been since they had stability at right tackle? We've gone yeah. through the Menelik Watsons, the Austin Howards, the Brendan Parkers. You know, they, there have been so many right tackles that haven't been able to stick at that position. I, I think finally the Raiders can have two bookend tackles if they get Fuaga, if he's available. Now, I will say about his uh, free agent quarterbacks available next year, I think Tua and Goff are going to sign extensions. There are already reports out that Tua is in extension talks with the Dolphins. Doesn't mean he will sign one, but they're obviously interested in possibly getting a deal done. Same goes with Goff. I think Goff is more likely to get the extension before Tua because there are some injury questions with Tua, right? Prescott is the interesting free agent target because i think it's a real possibility that prescott could hit the market depending on what happens with the cowboys i have a feeling that the cowboys are going to regress this year maybe i'm wrong but if they do and 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 they start kind of not start over but reload get a new head coach that head coach may want a new quarterback prescott could be on the market if the raiders want to go in that direction what i will say about the rookie quarterbacks this year and passing on them my idea my my feeling is for the raiders 
Knicks, Penix, and I think Rattler is also on their radar on mm-hmm. day two, right? Yep. yep. A lot of Raider fans like Jordan Travis, and I will say this about Jordan Travis, and the reason I haven't gone in on Jordan Travis as a big option for the Raiders is because Jordan Travis is probably going to go in the fourth or fifth round because of his injury, right? If you're the Raiders, you already have a former fourth rounder on your roster in Aiden O'Connell. Mm-hmm. If you draft Jordan Travis, he's not going to compete for the starting job this year anyway because he's still coming off of injury. While he is doing workouts and all that great stuff, he's probably not going to see the field until late summer at the earliest because, remember, right. he suffered his injury in November. So if you draft Jordan Travis, you're still going to have Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Mitchell compete for the job unless you think Jordan Travis could be a franchise guy why use a pick on a fourth, fifth rounder when you could just draft a quarterback next year who could be ready at the same time as Joy Travis? Because, again, he's coming off of a major injury. So I wouldn't draft Joy Travis in the middle rounds. If you're not going to go Penix, Knicks, or Rattler on the, within the first three rounds, just draft the quarterback next year. Right. Yeah. And you look at this, too, because people are saying, well, just wait till next year. You look at the quarterback class this year, which, of course, has been the, the narrative from media all offseason was about the, this quarterback class is amazing. And you look at the class for next year, right? Shador Sanders, Drew Aller from um, Penn State, who I'm not a huge fan of. Then you have Carter Wegman from Texas A&M, Carson Beck, Quinn Ewers, former Ohio State, now Texas quarterback there. And you look at the rankings, and I, I did it, an aggregate of them. This year, five of the six quarterbacks that we talk about mostly, five of them, when you look at the different draft ratings, Mo, they're all all five or 90 or above on this scale, roughly. Some people have them in the high 80s, depending, but most of them have them in the 90s. Next year, the only quarterback in the 90s at all is Shador Sanders at 91. So just to show you the difference in the class. So if you wait till next year, not saying one of these guys – like Carson Beck at Georgia can't be successful in the NFL, but the class is a notch down from where it is this year, including the Penixes and the J.J. McCarthy's, whether you like those guys or not. So, so you're taking a risk there because it's just not as deep of a class. So we'll see. I, and, and I think even a Spencer Rattler, like you said, on a day two, wouldn't be a bad move if they can't get a guy at the high of the draft because even he ranks higher than some of the top six uh, next year. Also, to revisit your point about the right tackle position. If you go back, historic lineups for the Raiders, going back to the big year, actually before the big year for Derek Carr in 16, 2015, Austin Howard was the right tackle two seasons in a row. Then you had Newhouse, then you had Parker in 18, then you had Trent Brown in 19, sometimes, right, because he didn't play that much. And then Sam Young, Brandon Parker again, Jermaine Illuminor two years in a row. So since 2015, you've only had a right tackle for two consecutive seasons in four of those almost 10 seasons, to your point. No consistency, nobody there. So it is a big deal. That's why you talk about Fuaga. It would make a lot of sense. Let's get a guy who's going to be there for 13, 14 years, whatever his playing career ends up being, uh, God willing. Then you think about that. That's why, as much as I would like to see the Raiders get a quarterback in the first round, if a Fuaga's there, man, you, you can't go wrong doing that. So, But anyway, Mike, thanks for your call in California. Really good call. I touched on a bunch of subjects there as well. All right, on to the next. Here we go. Raider Nation Mailbag. Good afternoon, Scott and Mo. Hope you guys Derek. are well. Greetings from Derek. Oakland. I'm here for work this week. Uh, stopped in Vegas on the way over here. <laughs> it is really nostalgic being back here. I've been here a few times previously for some games. and Just the nostalgia of, of where we were in the just the history and the great memories. I drove by the stadium on the way to the hotel, and it just reminds me of how fed up all Raider fans should be with just the last 20-plus years of complete <laughs> mediocrity. I'm just fed up with it. I wanted to get you guys' thoughts on something uh, when, when it comes to draft positions of need. I've got a particular sequence. I wanted to see if you guys agreed with me. First quarterback, then offensive tackle, then cornerback, then running back, and then wide receiver. Devontae Adams, as great as he is, is not a spring chicken. Since 2016, we have butchered the draft with specifically the first round. 2016, Carl Joseph out of the league. 2017, Gary on Conley out of the league. 2018, Colton Miller. We hit a home run with him. 2019 was brutal. Cleveland Farrell, Josh Jacobs, and Jonathan Abram. 2020, Henry Ruggs and Damon Arnett. They are both now inmates. Uh, 2021 was Leatherwood. Just horrible. And then 2022 is yet to be determined, um, excuse me, 2023 with Tyree Wilson. Um, we have currently, and I want to see if you guys agree with this as well, we have, I have identified six elite players on our team currently, Max Crosby, Christian Wilkins, Colton Miller, 
Devontae Adams, A.J. Cole, and Daniel Carlson. Carlson, I want to see if you guys agreed with that. Looking forward to you guys' show this week as we inch closer towards the draft. Have a great week, and I will talk to you guys soon. Go Raiders. Bye-bye. There's our guy, Tarek, calls in every show, and he was here in Cincinnati. I didn't get a chance to see him. Of course, work, you know, and, and schedules and all that stuff. So hopefully he'll be back again and I get to meet him uh, in person. So if you're ever passing through, let me know and I'll come meet you. So uh, anyway, but some good points there. He talked about the – let's start with the elite players. I think his list is pretty accurate. Um, but, Mo, one thing we've talked about, and I haven't seen a lot of people talk about There's a couple other folks that, that cover the Raiders, and I give them credit for, for doing so, is wide receiver. I'm not saying it's a top three need. I'm not saying that they should think about a receiver in this draft in the top three rounds. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I think next year there's a great, another great wide receiver class coming out, including Burden at Missouri, including Ibuka, if I get it right, at Ohio State. There's, there's a lot of guys coming out next year, and I think where the Raiders, if they address some of the key needs they have this year, they could be in a prime position next year to take a receiver uh, in the first couple rounds of the draft. Um, but, but some good points there. I understand the frustration. He went through the laundry list, the dirty, dirty laundry list of <laughs> draft picks that haven't made it. And and I understand that's why the Raiders are where they are, but we've got to think about moving forward, folks. Like it's it's you have a new GM, you have a new coach, a new era for the Raiders. I know it's repeated itself over and over again, but I don't think you can look back at those failures anymore. What you need to do is look at this class. What does Tom Telesco do? Right, Mo? What does he do? How many issues can he address in one draft? You can't do them all. But start evaluating the Raiders now on their drafts starting after next week. Here's what I say. Here's why I say I think the Raiders draft will be different than recent years in terms of success. Right. So if you look at some of the picks that <laughs> Terry talk, talked about, right. Reggie McKenzie, when he took the Raiders' job, was the first time GM. Now, he was around for a while. You would think he'd get, he would get better. Now, he had a home run class in, I believe, 2014 that helped his team in 2016 get to the playoffs. But overall, shoddy uh, draft record, decent in some areas, not so decent in, in, you know, on day two. I think that was the running joke with Reggie McKenzie on day two and, uh, on day two or rounds two and three. Draft picks weren't so good. You look at Mike Mayock, was a first-time GM. Look at Dave Ziegler, was a first time full time GM. Now you're getting Tom Telesco, who, as I've said many times, has a long track record. He's been a mm -hmm. GM for a decade plus. So you're not getting, Raider fans, you're not getting a first time GM who's learning on the job, so to speak, when it comes to putting together these draft classes. You're getting an experienced veteran. Now, a lot of people didn't like the Tom Telesco hire, but I think it's a positive in a sense that, again, he's not learning on the job. He's done this before, he's done this for a decade plus. Not to say that all his picks are going to be home run picks, but he knows how to maneuver the draft. He's gone through this process so many times, and I think you'll get better results out of him, especially in the first rounds. Yes, that's not, no, I agree 100%. And I think you have to, especially with, like I was, when the Tom Telesco hire happened, and I told this story on the air, I, I texted our good friend um, Scott Kaplan down at ESPN in Los Angeles, uh, of course, and because he's covered the Chargers for so long and been brutal on the Chargers because uh, obviously he's in San Diego, too, even though he works on the L.A. station. And um, I asked him, he said, great guy. He's like, this is a great hire. And I was like, because I was mixed about it. I'm like, wait, they never got over the hump there. Now, a lot of that was coaching, but he hired the coaches. But if you think about it from this perspective, and I think you've mentioned this before on this show, and you just kind of alluded to it a little bit, too, my friend, which is you have a rookie head coach. As much as everybody loves... Antonio Pierce, he's still, it's the first time he's going to be a head coach full time. Okay. He'll make mistakes. They all do. Shouldn't, shouldn't, he's not going to be perfect. So having an experienced GM, especially heading into the draft, knowing what to address, knowing how to help a rookie head coach think about roster is huge. It really is huge. And so I have to give Mark Davis and the Raiders committee there uh, credit because I think that whether or not Tom Telesco is the GM in 10 years, I don't know. But I'm just telling you that at this moment in time with this coach, I think it was a great hire. And I think that you have to look and hopefully he changes that trajectory because he has a record. You've seen it. You did a story up on uh, Sports Not about his drafts, the history of his drafts. And I invite people to go back and look for that because it's a great piece. I'll, I'll put it down in the description on YouTube and on the podcast so you can read Mo's piece. 
But you, you can infer from that a lot, and I think the Raiders are in good hands there. They might not pick who you want them to at what spot, but I think overall Tom Telesco will make this roster better than it is today. I agree. So, And I'll say that I've looked at a lot of his past drafts and a lot of guys he's picked I've been a big fan of. Yeah. Uh, Tui Tupalatu to, to last year was a guy I pounded the table for for the Raiders to draft before I he knew did. Malcolm Kuntz would break out. And the Chargers drafted him. Now, he was the third edge rusher behind Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa, but he played pretty well in a flash. If one of those guys goes down, he can definitely be a starter. Correct. And and the Raiders have immediate needs. I get that. But And I know, I know this will fall on deaf ears, but I'm going to say it anyway, Mo, because we get guilty of it sometimes too. And that is guys have to develop. They're, not everybody comes right into the NFL and is an all pro. Okay. So, so you talk about – you talk about that draft pick, the fact that he was the third edge rusher. It doesn't matter. If he develops, then you're good. Like, then the draft pick was worth it. Even if you have to wait two years for him to hit his stride, same goes for Tyree Wilson. Some of you guys are convinced he's a bust. Most of us, and even Baldy said last Tuesday, that, hey, you know what? He came on strong at the end of the season, so let's see how he gets through camp. I expect to hear a lot of good things out of camp from him, and then when we get to the season, uh, I think he'll be a better player. So there you go. Good stuff. Always good stuff here on the Raider Nation mailbag. All right, on to the next call. Remember, you can call in 702-900-7869 is the Raider Nation hotline. Here we go. If. There we go. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. It's Anthony. I'm from uh, Sacramento. First time caller. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was um, the draft, like everyone else, but specifically the quarterback position. Um, I'd love to get Jaden Daniels. I don't see that happening, but um, I've kind of shifted my focus to, towards Michael Penix. Um, I feel like at 13, we should probably go best tackle available uh, just to shore up that right side of the offensive line. Uh, obviously, I think we're set at, at the left side with uh, Parham, Miller, and then, you know, bringing Andre James back. Um, so, you know, whether that be Fuaga or – Oh, Fashanu or Fatanu from Washington. Um, one of those guys to plug and play at right guard or right tackle, I think, is, is vital. Uh, and then I feel like we should trade back into the first, um, you know, somewhere in the 25 to 30 range, just so we can get that fifth-year option for our quarterback um, and hopefully take Penix with one of those picks. I don't know what it would take, you know, maybe – more than likely 44 next year's first. I don't know if that's too much, you know, compensation for a pick in that, that half of the draft. Um, but I did want to get your guys' thoughts on Penix being a lefty and how that would correlate into Getsy's system. Um, I don't remember seeing or hearing any issues like with, with Tua and Mike McDaniel's system, but obviously they're different. Um, so yeah, just sort of wondering what your thoughts are on that. Thanks guys. Go Raiders. All right. There's Anthony. First time caller in Sacramento. Appreciate it. We've got lots of, lots of listeners in Sacramento. Uh, the, the temporary home of the future Las Vegas A's, by the way, strange situation. <laughs> uh, but Anthony, thanks for calling in. Mo, what do you, what do you give, uh, what do you got to give back to Anthony on his call and, and what he was talking about with the quarterbacks and sort of what the approach is for the Raiders? Anthony was preaching from the Midtown Mo playbook. Talked about getting a tackle at 13. Talked about tra uh, trading into the first round to get a quarterback. Another point that I've made. Uh, so he he's definitely, we're definitely in sync and in line with our draft plan for the Raiders. What I will say, and I'll get to this point because I think it's a point that we haven't talked about much, right? If the mm -hmm. Raiders were to trade back into the first round, into the late 20s, I think Anthony mentioned 25, late, you know, late 20s, mid to late 20s. I don't think they will have to give up a future first round. I think that was the question that Anthony had yeah. with that yep. scenario. If they go, I think above 20, you, you, you'll probably have to pay the quarterback tax and give up, you know, offer a first. But I think 25 and below, if you're trading back into that area, you could probably give up. You probably have to give up second, you know, future second rounder. You know, and maybe yeah. a, a pick in the middle rounds of this year's draft to move up because I, I would compare it to again the Will Levis trade that the Titans made last year. I know it was a second rounder, but it's not far from 25. It's just it's not even 10 spots away from 25 if you're comparing 
where Will Levis went last year and, uh, you know, the 25th, the 26th, the 27th pick. So I don't think the Raiders, if they do this trading up to the first round, don't think it would have, I don't think it would cost a future first rounder. Mm. Probably will cost a second rounder next year and a, and a middle rounder this year, but they can get it done. If Penix, if they think that Penix is going to be available in the back end of the first round. Now I'm going to say this again, I'm a Penix guy, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Raiders have that plan also for Bo Nix. Let's say the Raiders trade back into the first round at 28 or 29 and get Bo Nix. I know Raider fans, a lot of Raider fans don't like Bo Nix, but I'm just putting it out there that I think he's a possibility for that plan trading back into the first round. Yeah. And I think, I think that you look at those quarterbacks too. And we talked about earlier in the show in the first segment, Mo, about quarterbacks that fit a system, right? And so Luke Getze has that, 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 open zone run offense, short passes, all that kind of stuff. It's a Shanahan offense is what people call it. It's kind of West Coast based. But look what Shanahan has done in San Francisco. He's adapted his offense. He's gone more to a power run offense, right? Uh, and, and with Purdy there, they've done it a little different. So so even if it's Knicks or if it's Penix, one of the, Knicks obviously fits right into that system. Penix does not. But I think in today's NFL, especially if they like him and he comes out and performs well, what they do is they'll adapt, right? There's no, there's no like black and white. If you don't fit this system exactly, well, guess what? You're going to have to fit in the system or you won't play. It doesn't work that way. But I do think that gives them options. So to your point, you're right. I think people aren't talking about Bo Nix to the Raiders at all because they're so focused on Penix. But I do believe that there's opportunities there. So... Now I will say why I I strongly feel Penix uh Nick Bonix is a fit for the Raiders offense. I won't say that Penix isn't is not a fit. I'm just saying no, Bonix is that. more of a fit. And I and I t- totally understand West Coast offense. It doesn't the West Coast offense is not completely devoid of deep passing, which mm-hmm. Penix does very well. You can have the short pass game set up the deep balls later in games or depending on the game flow. I get that. But when you look at when you look at how Oregon handled Bo Nix or put him in the offense. And, and he said, you know, I was more of myself in Oregon than I was at Auburn. Oregon let Bo be Bo. Mm-hmm. And I understand Bo Nix didn't throw down a field a whole lot. Kind of scatter shot when it comes to his depot accuracy, which Penix has that in spades. But with more with more passes downfield, I think he can get the job done. Because you're not going to probably ask him to throw a bunch of deep bombs downfield in Luke Getz's offense. But those short passes, those intermediate passes, that's where that's where he eats, Bo Nix. And I think that's what the Raiders are going to look at and say, if we can get that going, get him into a rhythm, we'll work on the deep ball passing. Right. And again, guys also develop. So so I go back, even Drew Pries, when he was with the Chargers, threw much more shorter passes as he got confidence, as he developed his skill set. And by the time he got to the Saints, he was throwing the ball deeper down the field. So it, it can come with time, too. So if it was a Bo Nix... He's more a plug and play is the way I put it, Mo, right? He, you plug him in that system. He already runs it. He can dish it off the ball quick. And then you could develop the long pass for him eventually. Not that he couldn't do it right away, but to, to, to make it more of your offense going forward, you could institute that more. But just remember these, and, and you've said this before too, those NFL offenses revolve around their talent. So they, they, they move it. Getsy will move things mm-hmm. around depending who the quarterback is. Uh, and and we'll see what happens there. But great call there. I appreciate the call from Sacramento. First-time caller, always good stuff. All right, on to the next. Here we go. This is – let me see. Who do I got here? This is Stan, I believe. Stan Silas, 19. What is up, Scott and Mo? This is uh, Raider Loke. Raider also Loke. Known as Stan Silas, 19, on the X. Dan. Uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, I'm always listening to you guys, whether it's on the commute to work, to and from work. Uh, at the gym or at a at a, a, a gathering with my in-laws if I want to zone out. But anyway, uh, <laughs> back to my call. So uh, yesterday I called in to a Q Meyer show um, on Raider Nation Radio talking about you. Um, my, my my theory on why drafting Penix over Jaden and trading the farm for Jaden Daniels would be a faster track to the Super Bowl. Hmm. And the reason why is because uh, just my theory on that. So... Instead of uh, trading the house for Jaden Daniels, you know, we'll be trading this year's first or the next year's first round pick. Uh, we could uh, draft a, not a, not the sexy pick, but an offensive tackle at 13 and then potentially uh, trade back into the first round to draft Penix for that fifth year option. 
and it um, consider using those uh, those draft picks for the next two years to build around the team around Penix. You know, you you got an offensive tackle for Waga, hopefully protecting the right side, which will be Penix's blind side. I don't want to go into details, but we know what we need as a team. So with with the act, with the draft pick that we didn't trade away for Jaden Daniels, we could build around the team, and that's why I am saying that you know drafting going with the smart pick, or offensive tackle, and trading back in the first round, or maybe getting Penix later. Uh, early in the second round, I mean, who knows? There's a lot of quarter uh, teams like the Rams that can get them early in the second, but, you know, that's uh, we're, we're, we'll see how that goes in the next two weeks. But that's just my thoughts on why uh, getting, uh, like Mo, Mo had mentioned in one of his pieces, uh, offensive tackle, even though not the sexy pick, and panic, <laughs> and new upgrade in the foreign forward, Jaden Daniels, would be a fast track to the Super Bowl. So that's just my thoughts on, on that. And it's crazy to think that we don't know what the Raiders are going to do in the draft in the next two weeks, but pretty exciting to see what they'll do. But, um, yeah, and if, all the, if, if things don't go plan with Penix, and who knows, in 2027 we'll have a, a better world on the team, and we could do what the Chiefs did, you know, trade uh, trade, uh, trade uh, early into the first round for our quarterback, kind of what they did with Mahomes. So just a wishful thinking, thinking about the future later ahead. And um, one last thing, happy belated birthday, Mo. Uh, I'd, um, not that. Really on the edge during the week, but kind of missed it. So I missed it all today. So happy belated birthday. So just my thoughts on that, on why I think Penix uh, will be smarter going with uh, Jaden Daniels. So, all right, this is Raider Loke and I'm out. There you go. Raider Loke, thanks for your call, man. We appreciate it. Appreciate you, it. Appreciate the birthday to... wishes too, man. Yes. And he used to call in uh, when I when I was on Raider Nation Radio and Q and I hosted the show together. Uh, he'd call in too. So good to hear from him and, and have him call in. And of course, a shout out to our buddy Q as well as all the folks at Raider Nation Radio. Uh, but uh, some good points there. It's right in line with what we were talking. The one thing I will say this is if if the Raiders were to do that, and we talked about it with a caller earlier, if the Raiders were able to get a tackle at 13, move into the back end of the first round, to me, that is like uh, uh, you you got you hit a home run. Right. And home runs aren't easy. They're not easy to do. Right. The, the odds are stacked against you. If that goes the Raiders way and you were to get a tackle on Penix at the bottom of the first round, dude, like a plus draft. It doesn't matter what happens the rest of the draft. Right. But it's going to be hard to do that. I'm not saying it's not impossible. I'm not trying to pour water on the on the on the idea that this will happen. But uh, I think it's it's conventional and and it's possible depending on a lot of factors that happen in the teams that are located there. And again, I still worry about the Rams taking Penix. I'm, I, it's like it, it's in the back of my head constantly. Scott, we've got a lot of rain over the past week. Don't rain on my parade. <laughs> Don't rain on my offensive tackle Michael Penix parade because that's been my ideal scenario. And I know it's some Raider fans have told me it's it's being greedy, trying to thread the needle and do and you know get the get the right tackle and get Penix. I I say go for it. You, you know because I I strongly feel like Penix. Even with the buzz that he's getting at this pro day, I still feel like Penix is going to be available on the back end of the first round. So mm -hmm. I think it's all about, for me, it's all about value. You get the tackle, you get a top tackle, a top three potentially tackle in the draft. Mm -hmm. And now you have two bookend tackles, one um, that can protect Penix's blind side. You get Penix at the back end of the first round. To, as you said, to me, that's an A-plus start for Tom Tusco if he can pull that off. Now, of course, there's a possibility that a team takes Penix. So if a team, let's say a team does swipe Penix after the Raiders take a tackle at 13, then what, right? Panic? No. What you do is say, okay, now we have a strong offensive line. So whoever the quarterback is, he'll be protected because now we have a top prospect at right tackle and we have Colt Miller at left tackle and we'll continue to build the rest of our roster. And it, you know, if the if it presents itself and the Raiders want Bo Nix or Spencer Rattler, and one of those guys wins the job, maybe that quarterback will be elevated because of the offensive line and the offensive playmakers that the Raiders have on the perimeter. Devontae Adams is still there. Jacoby Myers had a pretty good first year with the Raiders. Trey Tucker coming along. You and I both think the Raiders are going to draft a wide receiver and add some speed. We also think that they're going to add a running back and add some explosive speed in the backfield. So the Raiders will have the supporting cast to support whoever the quarterback is. Of course, a lot of people want Penix, and I get that. But I think whoever it is that starts week one, is going to have a pretty good supporting cast. There you go. Appreciate it. Thanks for your call, Raider Loke. We'll talk to you next time for sure. All right, next is Angel and Cali. Here's Angel. Yo, what's going on, Silver and Black today? This is Angel from Southern California. I'm just calling to ask, you know, just a question or two. So I'm wondering, one, if we 
we just got news that Mark Davis gave uh, Antonio Pierce and Tom Telesco uh, permission to trade up. If we do trade up, is there something that's too much? I know Jaden Daniels is a big name for us, but is there something that's too much? I personally wouldn't mind because I, I think if that's their guy, then they would go get him. But is there, is there too much? Also, uh, would you guys be interested in trading back if we if we were given the option to? Um, also, another thing to add on to that is that um, I still don't think even if we trade back, I don't necessarily think that we'll get a quarterback in the in the second round. If if we don't get the you know one of the top four or five guys, I don't really see us getting one since we you know we signed Gardner Minshew to that contract and we have Ian O'Connell who did decent last year. But yeah, thank you guys so much. Have a good day. All right, there you go. Angel in SoCal, appreciate the call. Uh, and Mo, I, like we talked about, I don't necessarily agree that if they don't get Penix, to your point about Nick, so you've been talking about it all the show, I, if they like him, I don't, I don't see why they wouldn't take him there uh, unless they just say, yeah, we like Minshew and we like O'Connell enough that we're going to go to another position of need like cornerback instead. I can see that happening. I don't see them, as we said from the top of the show, I don't see them tr giving enough capital to trade up. And I don't know that there will be a trade partner in the top three. Right. And this is a question that I wanted to ask Baldy, but I know his time is very limited. I was going to ask him, what is if the Rays were to trade up for him, what would be too much to offer? And you've heard a lot of people say it was probably going to cost three first rounders because I compared it again to the 49ers deal with the Dolphins. Mm hmm. Probably going to have to give up three first rounders and probably a a day two pick. And as I said on Bleacher Report Live recently, yesterday's price is not today's price, as Fat Joe would say. <laughs> so they're probably it's probably be a little bit more. So I think at this point, if if you think Jaden Daniels is the guy, I think you know three first rounders is probably what you're going to have to pay, and that's that wouldn't be too much for my threshold because I think he'd be worth it. I think he could be a franchise quarterback. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I'm just like, all right, I'd rather just draft the quarterback at 13 if I'm going to be that desperate. Another point I want to make that he brought up, Angel, that Angel brought up about um, Mark Davis basically giving his blessing to Tom Telesco to trade up. I think that that's a, that's just I, I wouldn't say it's it's a it's a non news item, but I think it's just Mark Davis putting it out there that, hey, we're trying. <laughs> Look, I we, we hear you, Raider Nation, that you want us to take a quarterback and move up to get a top quarterback prospect. We're trying. But as yeah. you said, you need cooperation in, in those situations because you can't trade up with yourself. You're going to have you have to have a willing partner. And I think it's going to be hard to convince the Washington commanders. Hey, commanders, pass on a quarter, a top quarterback and move all the way back to 13. You know, and I think that's the biggest problem for the Raiders because I talked about it in the first segment that if the Raiders had a higher pick, let's say the Raiders were picking seventh, I think it would be a higher chance, a higher probability that they could trade up because the team picking third or, or fourth may say, okay, we'll slide back a few spots and still get a top prospect. Mm -hmm. If you're trading with the Raiders, you're dropping all the way down to 13. 13 so you're dropping right. outside of the top 10. So you're asking a team to give up on a potentially a top player at, at, at that position for maybe the third, fourth, or fifth best player at that position. So I, I think it'll be a tough sell. The last thing I want to get to, and it was his point about, you know, if the Raiders don't get a quarterback in the first rounds, first couple of rounds, then they better off just building the roster, not drafting a quarterback. And I, I agree with that. The only quarterback I would take on day two, and I've said this before, is Spencer Rattler. I think he would be worth a developmental spot on the roster because I think he has upside as a potential starter. Joe Milton, Jordan Travis... Just draft the quarterback next year if you're drafting those guys, if you're thinking about drafting those guys in the fifth round, because I don't think they're going to be ready to play this upcoming season. Mm -hmm. Good point. Great stuff. Angel, thanks for the call, man. And last mm -hmm. but not least, of course, we close the show with our good friend, Jacob. Jacob from Fresno. In Fresno. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> this is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? What's up, guys? <laughs> good old, good old Jacob from Fresno back on the phone, uh, calling you about you guessed it, one a Jaden Daniels once again. No, I got a. I'm gonna try and keep it brief. Now, a quick question. 
I hear you guys. I'm listening to you on the Tuesday night podcast. This episode, you guys mentioned, wouldn't you know it, Jaden Daniels once again. And, Scott, you seem to just think that it's impossible. And I I don't know that it's really quite impossible at this point at least. I know the Bears are locked in on Caleb Williams, right? And Washington, I think they like Jaden Daniels. It's it's definitely attractive, but I don't think they're quite locked in yet. And I think AP is definitely locked in. We're at two. We're getting Jaden Daniels. No problem. But the problem is we got to move up from 13. That's a big deal. That's a lot you got to trade in. So what I'm going to ask this week, how much is too much? If you ask me, I'm willing to send three, three, or three firsts, right? That's definitely, that's doable, you say. It's probably going to cost three firsts. Yeah, let's do it, three firsts. But then I'm thinking, uh, we might have to send three seconds. So we send our next three second rounders. Is that too much? What if we do our next three seconds and a third this year? Is that too much? How much is too much? I appreciate you guys. You take it easy. Go <laughs> our man Jacob in Fresno, <clears throat> always enjoyable and, and entertaining, but also good questions. And I know we just we had a question very similar from Angel right before him. And I want to say this, Jacob, as you're listening to us out in the Central Valley, uh, probably rolling down 99, uh, is not impossible, but improbable. Right. The difference between impossible is it, it can never happen. Improbable means it probably won't happen. So. I'll go with improbable. But you just mentioned, I, I don't have the problem with three number ones, Mo. Then it gets to the middle rounds. If it was three number ones and three number twos, I would have a problem because that means for the next three draft or excuse me, two drafts past this, 25, 26, you have no first or seconds. That's a yes, lot. That's, that's, that's a lot. Much. That's, that's too way much. too much. So three number ones and a number four and a five the year after. Okay, fine. Middle round draft picks. I, I'm okay with that because – Teams know fourth round picks you can hit on quite a bit, so I get it. But yeah, not three ones, three twos, and another. That to me is just way too much. It puts the team back. It would might remind me a little bit of kind of what the Rams did a while back, where they had no draft picks for two years in a row. Three ones and two threes. After that, I, I'm like, all right, that, that's getting a little too because you gotta, you still have to build the rest of the roster because guys are gonna get older, guys mm -hmm. are gonna, you know, be out of their contract. You're gonna cut guys. You're gonna have to fill other spots, and you want those cheap contracts uh, down the line to build around your quarterback. So you don't want to give too too much draft capital. You want to have an even balance. But I think again, I think the 49ers Dolphins deal is the model: three firsts and a third, and then again, as you know, inflation quarterback tax you're, you're probably adding on another third rounder to get the deal done this year but I, but i will say I, i'm mentioning nicks a lot in this on this show for a reason <laughs> it's not because i love oh. nicks but it's because i'm trying to prepare raider fans and i'm trying to prepare listeners just in case things don't go as they want it to go because as i said at the top of the show how many drafts have you watched raider drafts have you watched and you said you know what that turned out exactly how I wanted it to turn out. We got the guys that I exactly <laughs> wanted in my mock draft simulator. It doesn't happen. I'm just saying that. And I'm not saying the Raiders won't get Jake Daniels or Bo or Michael Penix, but those seem to be the two cornerbacks that Raider Nation loves right now. But I'm just saying prepare yourself just in case neither of those quarterbacks end up on the Raiders roster. Jacob from Fresno, who likes Jake Daniels, and the growing support for Michael Penix. Again, I'm a Michael Penix guy. I've said multiple times that I would even give up three first runners for Jaden Daniels. I'm on board with you all with the Michael Penix and Jaden Daniels to Raiders train. I'm on board with that. All I'm saying is I've watched another Raider, enough Raider drafts even before I came a writer, and I've been disappointed time after time after time again, and I'm preparing myself just in case the Raiders don't wind up with Jaden Daniels <laughs> or Michael Penix. So I'm putting the Bo Nix out, stuff out there for a reason. There you go. If you want to be a part of the Raider Nation mailbag, call in 702-900-7869, 702-900-7869. You know, it's funny. I was talking to a friend here locally, but when I hear this from a lot of Raider fans too, with 
Penix because there's so much energy around Penix because I think people in Raider Nation feel that's attainable. Oh, he's so old. He's 24. 24. He's 24 years old. Did everybody realize that Aiden O'Connell was 24 last year? But, right. But do you know Spencer Rattler will be 24 when the season starts? Do you know Michael Penix is 24? Do you know Bo Nix will be 24 in this in in the 24 season? I mean, Drake May, I think, is the youngest at 21. Jaden Daniels is 22. Remember COVID and injury years, especially with Michael Penix. So all of these players, a year was was basically robbed from them. So they they got a they got an exemption year. So mm-hmm. they're always going to be older. A guy's usually 21, 22. Instead, they're 23, 24, <laughs> with the exception of one, and that's Drake May, who came in after. So this age thing, I just don't get it because it's it's not like guys are coming into the league at 20 years old. But, Scott, what is the difference? Okay, so let's say my Michael Penks was 23. Would you feel – for the people who are <laughs> worried about age, if he was 23 and not 24, would, would it make that big of a difference to you it's, if he exactly. was 23? Oh, 23 is okay, but 24, oh, no. Can't yeah. have an old quarterback at 24. I, it's a – to me, it, it does – again, we talked about this on the show. Quarterbacks, if they play for 10 years, so you don't have to worry about the quarterback position for 10 years, I would sign up for that. If I'm getting Michael Penix for 10 years, 9, 10 years, I'm good with that. One thing I do want to address really quick, Scott, before we get off air, and I think it was one of the – I'm not sure if it was Anthony or Mike. One of the callers asked about lefty quarterbacks, and we didn't really oh, touch yeah. on that, about what is the difference or is there any difficulty from switching from a right-handed quarterback to a left-handed quarterback. We talked about – yeah, the right tackle is going to be his blind side protector. But I think when it comes to a left-handed quarterback, now I'm not a professional football player, but I had a friend who, you know, I played football with growing up. He was a lefty. And, and from my experience, from my personal experience, again, I'm not a professional. I didn't play in the NFL. Didn't, I'm not, you know, wasn't a five-star recruit or anything. But there is, there is a, a, an adjustment. The way the ball spins, I guess you would say, the way you have to catch yeah. the football. If, but, you know, practice will eliminate those that transition because you're going to – if Michael Penix were to be drafted by the Raiders, they're going to go through a bunch of practices. So they're going to get used to catching the football from a left-handed quarterback, and they'll be able to adjust hopefully by week one, and you won't see any hiccups where it's like, oh, well, got a left-handed quarterback, got to adjust. You go through that at, you know, mini camp, training camp, preseason. They'll get over that because I haven't heard really any issues. Tua has been in Miami for a while now. I haven't heard yeah. any real issues with long-term adjustments to a left-handed quarterback from players. Right. I mean, of course, Ken Stabler was a lefty. We can go through the list, right? Ken, uh, Michael Vick was a lefty. And so you look at those guys, what they were able to do and be successful. Um, not a big deal. I think it gets – I mean, even Matt Leinart was a lefty, if I recall. So uh, you're right. There's a, there's an adjustment there, but, but so what? Um, and then the last thing on age, I mean, you look at Joe Burrow was 23, turned 24 at the end of his first season. Now he got injured that season, but this 23, 24 year age, now he's 27, different story. I get it. You know, that's, that's, that would be considered old for a rookie quarterback, but this 23, 24 age, especially after COVID, um, I don't see it as any big deal. So, but anyway, thank you guys all for your calls. We certainly appreciate that. And again, 702-900-7869. If you want to call in for the next show, just leave your name, where you're calling from, and your message up on the hotline, and we will get it on the next show. Mo, let everybody know what else you got going this week. Of course, today's Thursday. We got Friday, and then we hit the weekend. And then next week, man, it's going to be all heavy draft stuff as it's about to happen up in Detroit. That's right. The Motor City is where the draft will be this year. Uh, but what do you got coming up? New Sports Not article is up on Raiders Sleepers, as I said On the previous show, if you didn't catch my Bleach Report live, I have five sleeper targets for the Raiders, who the Raiders should target between rounds four and seven. Monday, upcoming this upcoming Monday, I will have my final Raiders mock draft over on Bleach Report. So I'm going to pull up the the PFF mock draft simulator and we'll be down to the home stretch. Last mock draft, then you don't have to hear about mock drafts until (laughs) next year. (laughs) Is Bo Nix going to be in that mock draft? Bo Nix probably won't make the mock draft. I think I've I've beat Raider fans over the head enough with the <laughs> Bo Nix talk today, so I'll leave him off the mock. But I'll have that on Monday. And also, I have some special Bleach Report lives that are coming up. We're, we're doing something special with mock drafts there, too. Not a full mock draft, but we're going to have some banter between uh, myself and division rivals, 
for representing other teams. So I'll have a mm. Broncos host up there. I have a Chargers host up there. I have a Chiefs host up there. And we're all going nice. to talk about what we should do with our first round picks for our teams. And we'll trash talk each other. And it'll be fun and pull up to the show and, and, and help me uh, talk badly about Chargers and Broncos and Chiefs fans. Good stuff. There you go. <laughs> Make sure you guys all watch that bleach report live it'll be fun i'm sure as yeah. everything mo does is good so make sure you stay tuned for that also he'll have a raiders piece as he mentioned up on sportsnot.com this week as well and i'll have a bunch of stuff next week on the raiders up there too so we will uh if you follow both of us on x.com of course mo's at mo moten i am at lv gully you can track what is going on there as we uh, move into draft week finally i have finally we're there. We don't have to talk about scenarios. We can actually instead talk about what they did. So it's all good. But we will have one more show before that on Tuesday with the latest information there as well. So make sure you tune to that. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Just look for Silver and Black today. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscription button and, very important, the notifications bell so you know when we have a new video. Mo, I will see you Tuesday, man. And uh, next week, we're, we're not going to get much sleep next week, but it's going to be fun. Can't wait for it to happen. Can't wait. Ready to go. All right. For Mo Moten, for our producer, who we appreciate very much, Mike Robier, I'm Scott Colbrans, and this has been Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. We will talk to you guys on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.